today on Just Solutions, Refugee Resettlement. The Biden administration recently announced it would not increase the refugee cap for this year from an already historic low. Chris Shomara Vignaraja, President and CEO of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service, joins us today to speak about what happens next, particularly with the growing number of refugees worldwide many of whom are displaced by the climate crisis. That's Free Speech TV, Just Solutions. Well, since that announcement was made about not raising the cap for this fiscal year, pressure has been put on the Biden administration and it seems to be successful. Well, Chris, what is happening now? Because now we're hearing that there's a walk back and potentially there will be an increase in the cap of refugees being allowed to resettle here in this fiscal year, but then an even more of an increase for next year. This is as a result of pressure from organizations like yours, but what, what's the latest? Yeah, so we are halfway through the fiscal year um, and have resettled a little over 2,000 refugees. Um, The current cap is actually a holdover from the Trump administration and is set at accepting 15,000 refugees. And it's unfortunate because it is actually at a time when we face the greatest refugee crisis in our history. Well, this is down from hundreds of thousands of refugees being accepted. Back in 1980, I believe it was about 231,000 refugees were resettled in the US. Now we're at historic lows. What are you calling for the Biden administration to raise that cap to in this fiscal year and then going forward? Yeah, so our aim for this fiscal year is to increase the cap to 62,500 on our way to reaching 125,000 for the next fiscal year, which is actually what President Biden had um, assured uh, as a candidate, um, as well as as president. So that's our aim, working with the administration. Well, we're going to dig into what's actually happening right now, but I think it's always good to clarify exactly what we're talking about. There are so there are so many different terms when it comes to people who move to different countries, and very often those terms are conflated and create confusion. So when we're talking about refugees, how are they different from asylum seekers or just immigrants in general? What exactly are we talking about? And then what is the resettlement program here in the U.S.? Yeah, so it's a great question because I do think people regularly um, conflate the two programs um, or misinterpret what we're talking about when we use the term refugee or an asylum seeker. So a refugee is someone who has crossed an international border and registered with the United Nations system. They will then reside in the third country as they are waiting uh, refugee status and relocation to a host nation like the United States. An asylum seeker is someone who presents at the country um, where they hope to seek legal relief um, of asylum. So those at our southern border who have come directly to the United States for relief are what we would describe as an asylum seeker. Those who may be in a refugee camp, um, you know, in Africa, hoping to come to the United States um, that is what we would describe. That is a person who we would describe as a as a refugee. Um, so they are two different systems. They're administered by two different federal agencies, uh, generally speaking, um, and they are two different legal pathways to get uh, ultimate residence here in the United States. Well, as I said, those terms are often conflated and President Biden himself, I think, conflated it uh, when he was talking about what's happening at the southern border and particularly when it comes to unaccompanied uh, minors. They are in a separate program as such. But but what is the connection? Because it seems that so often there are political discussions saying, well, we have a finite number of people who can come in. So if they're coming in this way, they can't come in that way. But you know, what are your thoughts on that, particularly what's happening at the southern border? Yeah, I think it's really important to be clear of where there are similarities and where there are differences. Um, the truth is that those who are seeking asylum um, and those who are uh, fleeing their home countries as refugees in some ways are fleeing for similar um, kind of reasons. Um, Some may be fleeing 
political or religious persecution, um, you know, rampant gun, uh, gang violence, um, uh, devastating natural disasters. Um, but ultimately, uh, they are coming and seeking refuge and protection here in the United States. Um, in terms of kind of the logistical and administrative differences, I think it's really important to be very clear. There is no logistical or administrative reason for why the U.S. can't administer both programs. In fact, historically speaking, we have been able to walk and chew gum. And given that both populations are incredibly vulnerable and have a legal claim to relief here in the United States, I think it's important for us to create two robust pathways in order to allow these individuals, these families, children to seek that relief here. Well, Free Speech TV is focusing on refugee resettlement in the coming weeks because we're premiering a documentary, A Home Called Nebraska, on May 6th, 7 p.m. Eastern. People can find it there. Um, and this takes a look at refugees being resettled in ostensibly a very conservative state. Yet in 2016, the state of Nebraska settled more refugees per capita than other states. And the documentary tells us the stories of the different folks who have come through the program. And as we're seeing, really heartwarming images of people being welcomed at the Omaha airport. And then it cuts to January 2017, when then President Donald Trump announced that essentially the entire program was being closed and there would be a travel ban. Under the Trump administration, not only did we see the number of refugees being resettled tank to hysteric lows, but we saw the entire system essentially being dismantled. Take us through exactly the damage that was done to the refugee resettlement program in those four years. Yeah, so let me start with the numbers. So at the beginning of the Trump administration, he inherited a what we call presidential determination of 110,000. It went from 110,000 to 45,000 to 30,000 to ultimately 15,000 is what the presidential determination um, is uh, at the end of the administration, the end of the Trump administration and what it is today. What that meant for the refugee resettlement infrastructure was that it was decimated. LIRS itself had to close 17 offices. Across the nine resettlement agencies that work with the State Department, we had to close more than 100 offices. That means that an infrastructure uh, that was created um, as part of welcoming refugees to our country uh, was decimated across the country. Um, six of the nine resettlement agencies are faith-based. And what we lost as a result was the expertise, um, the knowledge, uh, the congregations and non-faith communities who support refugee resettlement, whether it's because they believe it's a matter of, of religious calling or it's who we are as a nation. Um, and so I think it's really important to realize where we are at this moment. Um, we are rebuilding. We have been doing so for many months. And so I am you know, confident that we can resettle well above the 15,000 current figure, but it is going to take some time. It is going to be um, a matter of public-private partnerships, working with communities like those in Nebraska and really all across the country. Refugee resettlement has always been a bipartisan program. In fact, we've resettled more refugees under Republican administrations than Democratic, one, and, uh, Democratic ones. And I think that just speaks to why this is a program um, that people support, whether they view it as a matter of faith, national security, economic growth, or who we are as a nation. Well, we'll talk more about what the community response looks like and particularly why communities are playing such an important role in refugee resettlement. But just in terms of the decimation of the entire program, I know many Homeland Security personnel who had been assigned to work specifically on refugee resettlement were reassigned to other jobs and those positions were never refilled. And not only did it stop new applications under the Trump administration, but many existing applications that were in process because this can take several years some of those actually timed out. So there really was immense damage done to people who had already gone through the exhaustive screening process to get to the US as a refugee. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to understand this is a years long 
process. Refugees who come to the United States are the most extremely vetted immigrants who come um, to, uh, to our land as, as foreigners. Um, they go through Department of Homeland Security checks, FBI checks, um, even Interpol is involved. And the complication is that when they are ultimately able and ready to come to the U.S., it really is the symphony of different, um, you know, visas and travel visas um, and, you know, admissions uh, that are involved that we have to synchronize in order for them actually to come to the U.S. And so just to give you kind of a concrete example of the human toll of the delays, we had a pregnant, pregnant mom who had received legal relief to resettle in the United States as a refugee. And because of the delays in lifting the Trump era eligibility categories, she actually got termed out or timed out um, of being able to travel because she had entered her third trimester. And as a result is now grounded until the birth of her baby. But these are the impacts. These are the costs in terms of human suffering of why, you know, you can call them bureaucratic delays, but that's what they entail. Well, we'd love to hear from our viewers. Let us know where you're watching and let us know if you're aware of any refugee resettlement programs in your community, because as we're going to talk about next with Chris, the community component is absolutely crucial. Now, Chris, in addition to being the president of LIRS, one of the country's largest re refugee resettlement programs, you yourself and your family came through a refugee resettlement program. And I know you were just a baby when you came to the country, but you're the living proof of the importance of having these programs. So you know what it's like from the uh, bureaucratic end in terms of resettling people, but also the personal of having come through it. You know, take us through what that's like, because it's very often those stories that we really need to hear to understand the impact of refugee resettlement. Yeah, so, so we actually came in 1980, which is when the 1980 Refugee Act passed. So we didn't technically come as refugees, but my family um, were part of the ethnic and religious minority in Sri Lanka and uh, were basically seeking refuge in any country that would take us. Um, at the time, we could only go to Nigeria. Uh, uh, you know, we were leaving Sri Lanka um, and my parents were teachers, so they were actually able to relocate to northern Nigeria, um, where some of your readers um, may remember uh, 276 girls got kidnapped just for going to school. So we had bags packed, plane tickets in hand, um, planning to travel there, when lo and behold, my uncle who had actually sponsored the family, um, our visas came through. So we didn't come as refugees, but we were very lucky um, and felt like we hit the jackpot. Um, my parents came when I was nine months old. Um, they came with no jobs, just a couple hundred dollars in their pockets and two very young kids in their arms. And I know how different my life would have been, whether we had remained in Sri Lanka as it got embroiled uh, in a devastating civil war or moved to Nigeria, um, you know, as a girl trying to get an education. And so I know that my daughter's life will be easier because my own parents' lives were hard. And to me, that is at the heart of what LIRS does and why it is so important for us to continue to be that beacon of hope and freedom to some of the most vulnerable populations fleeing the most dire of circumstances all around the world. Well, let's talk about the community support and why that is such a crucial part of refugee resettlement programs. Many of the programs here in the US are actually faith-based and so they're, all very, they're already very much part of communities and they recruit volunteers who welcome families, they're meeting people at the airport. And as you described from your own family's experience, these are people who are showing up with literally nothing, maybe a plastic bag is full of all the belongings that they have because they've had to flee, you know, the most dire circumstances. And so having these people from the community be the group at the airport welcoming them, but then also setting them up in houses, in homes, with groceries, helping, you know, get kids get settled. Take us through what community members do and how that's such a crucial uh, component of refugee resettlement. Yeah, so it's pretty incredible. I mean, what happens is um, when a refugee family arrives, uh, we and our staff will actually be there at the airport um, upon their arrival. Uh, we will help 
um, you know, set up, a, a find an affordable um, home apartment for them to move into. Uh, we working with the community will actually, um, you know, furnish it with some modest furnishings, make sure there are even some culturally familiar foods in the kitchen, uh, just to make those first few days a little less strange um, as they enter a new land. Um, what we also will do is make sure that they know what community-based resources are available. We'll help them navigate you know, the public transportation system. So much of this work is, is time intensive. Um, it, it involves a lot of, uh, you know, you could call it human hours. Um, and so that's where working in communities across the country uh, with congregations, with volunteers is critically important. It is volunteers who can help us uh, drive a refugee to an English as a second language course or can help navigate the public transportation system um, so that they are able to, uh, you know, without a car, um, navigate those first few days. I can tell you when we first uh, came to Baltimore, um, you know, uh, my dad would hop on the bus and he would um, go to work. He was a Baltimore City public school teacher. But it was actually the superintendent of the schools who found um, the basement apartment that we moved into. It was the vice principal of his school who vouched for our family as we were starting a bank account, who literally helped us move into that basement apartment. And so that is where community is so critical because it serves initially as the neighbors who welcome um, a family, but ultimately it is the extended family, that support network to help navigate not just those first few days or first few months, but really the first few years as America becomes their new home country. Well, as we'll see in a home called Nebraska and viewers will see when they tune in for the premiere next week, there was a huge outpouring of community support for refugees after Donald Trump announced the travel ban back in 2017 and lots and lots of people showed up wanting to volunteer. Now, that has maybe fallen from the news recently. Well, it's back in the news again because of uh, what's happening with the Biden administration. But for viewers who may, be not aware, may not be aware of refugee resettlement in their own community, what would you say to them about the benefits to the community to have refugees come and settle in your community and the benefits for people who are already here and being part of that welcoming committee, not just showing up at the airport, but as you described, investing in these families. So you're there with them for, for many, many years because we often focus on the, the benefit to the refugee, obviously coming here, but there are massive benefits to communities who get to welcome these families as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's really important. Anyone out there who uses Google or PayPal or WhatsApp um, or an iPhone should recognize that those are inventions um, that were thanks to immigrants who came to the United States. So what that means is it's you know the devices we're using. Um, it's the entrepreneurs who are in our community creating jobs. I think it's um, you know worth saying refugee resettlement isn't just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. Um, what it means is uh, economic rejuvenation of communities that may be suffering from population decline. decline. Um, it may be, you know, if you look at the data, there was a study that was actually initially released and then suppressed during the Trump administration in 2015. Um, it was, you know, data from 2015 that actually showed that refugees were a net contributor of $63 billion into our communities, local, state, federal coffers. And at a time when you know, we are coming out of a pandemic and thinking about economic recovery, it's important to highlight that refugees have higher entrepreneurial rates than native born Americans. Um, but beyond that, when you think about national security, refugee resettlement and the infrastructure is how we actually work with those who are given special immigrant visas. These are the, the interpreter, uh, you know, the drivers, um, those who work alongside our U.S. military when they're deployed abroad. And so, some of our strongest advocates are actually national security experts who say that one of the most important things we can do to secure our borders and make sure Americans stay safe is actually supporting refugee resettlement. There's also another study that was done that looked at those cities that received the highest number of refugees per capita. And what it proved was that refugees actually make communities safer. Uh, you know, 
commercial violence, um, you know, uh, violent crimes actually decrease when refugees are integrated into those communities. And so I think it's really important to recognize that it is who we are as a nation, but it's also how we have become who we are as a nation, and it's how we will continue to prosper into the future. We're going to talk about how the climate crisis is driving the record numbers of refugees right now and displacement, in addition to the endless wars that are also happening. But what countries or what regions are we currently getting the most either refugees coming in from or at least the applications from? Where is the, the greatest need? In terms of climate refugees? Well, just refugees in general, then we'll talk about climate refugees. Sure, yeah. So um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, Ukraine, Afghanistan, Iraq um, are, are some of those countries that have really um, uh, sent um, quite a number of refugees. It's not surprising when you think about the turmoil in some of those areas. But what about then the climate crisis? I know on Earth Day you, you wrote a, an article about how we need to acknowledge the fact that the climate crisis is contributing to massive levels of displacement and exacerbating the, the desperate needs of many others being displaced due to other circumstances like war and conflict. So what is happening right now with the climate crisis and its relationship to refugees and displaced people? Yeah, um, appreciate you raising that because this is an issue that hits close to home. Um, you know, I'll start just by saying that here in the United States, we are seeing the impacts of climate uh, and the crisis and how that's actually displacing um, or going to lead to the displacement of, of individuals, Americans um, here at home. So we've done events that have highlighted what's happening with indigenous population living on the Ile de Jean Charles as well as communities in Shishmarab, Alaska, who within our lifetimes will have to resettle as a result of rising sea levels. But we're seeing this all across the globe. And it isn't something that's you know, well into the future, but an impact we're seeing actually today and even in the recent past. About um, 22.5 million uh, have been displaced every year um, between uh, you know, the last decade and today, um, we're going to be seeing 200 million who are displaced by 2050. Um, here in our region, we know that 40% of the migrants we see coming from Central America are actually displaced as a result of the climate crisis. And this is just going to continue to grow going into the future. Well, our current legal framework doesn't seem to be fit for purpose for what we're dealing with right now, let alone what's ahead due to the climate crisis. Are you seeing at least an acknowledgement of the fact that the climate crisis is just going to worsen this when we're seeing, say, the Biden administration now rolling back, you know, its earlier statement saying, well, they will consider increasing the cap, but are you seeing climate as being part of some of those considerations, particularly for the long term, the long range uh, impacts of all of this? There are a few glimmers of hope. Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, concerning that we've seen reference to climate displacement or climate immigration as early as 1980 in some of the UN documents talking about migration. And yet today, there's still no country in the world that has created a legal pathway for relief for those who are um, you know, forced to flee their homes or no longer have a homeland as a result of the climate crisis. And knowing that in the next 30 years, we will see 340 million displaced, this is a stark and dire reality where we need to take action today. And so part of our hope is that the United States can actually lead the charge we were heartened to see um, Biden, uh, President Biden actually in a climate executive order um, recognize this reality and require a report uh, to be submitted um, uh, in basically within this year uh, to look at um, this issue and to provide some recommendations. Um, I testified in front of the Senate Climate Crisis Task Force in 2019 around a bill that Senator Markey had introduced that would actually create a legal pathway and allow for 50,000 um, climate uh, displaced persons to come to the United States. Our hope is that in the next couple of years, we will actually see the U.S. create the first pathway and that other countries around the world 
will look to what the United States has done and follow suit. Um, New Zealand did try to create a humanitarian visa and ultimately didn't go that way. But our hope is that the world can come together and recognize that this is a reality of global proportion and that we need to respond. Well, just in the last few minutes that we have, uh, Chris, what, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions that uh, regular people have about refugees? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things um, I regularly hear is, well, you know, they're fleeing from their homes, um, you know, they're coming for economic opportunity, and, and that's not right. And I think it's really important to just first remember, you know, here in the United States, so many, uh, you know, populations who migrated came for that very reason. You know, my husband, it's where you get the Omera part of my name, is, uh, you know, Irish Catholic. Um, you know, he, he would say that his ancestors came to the United States because of the Irish potato famines. These are the different migration patterns that led America to become the nation that we are. And so I don't think that we should kind of, you know, look down on migrants who are fleeing for different reasons and coming to the United States. But I think we also need to recognize dire realities. So many are fleeing because they don't have a choice. Um, you know, we are one of the two agencies that works with unaccompanied refugee minors. These are children who come to this country without parents because they have no other place to go. And this is why America has been the global, you know, the leader of the free world because we have been a safe haven. And so I think my hope is that people will recognize that these individuals, they're fleeing because children are conscripted into, into military, um, into armies. Uh, they're fleeing because of political persecution. They're fleeing because of religious persecution and who they pray to. They're fleeing because um, they're a member of the LGBTQ community and they are ostracized or targeted simply because of who they love. These are the individuals who need our help. We have been capable of this humanitarian relief in the past. I know because of my vantage point, there are communities across our country who are welcoming, who are opening their hearts and their homes and are willing to help. And I just hope that our federal policy and our global policy will follow suit in order to recognize the need and respond and step up. Well, in the last minute that we have, Krish, as that policy is currently being considered and crafted by the Biden administration, and as he has shown his willingness to listen to agencies like yours and other advocates for refugee resettlement, what can viewers do if they're interested, concerned about this particular issue, as we are in this moment where there is the possibility of increasing the cap right now? Yeah, so there is an immediate need for our political leaders to hear that you care about this issue. And so if you go to www.lirs.org, we have action alerts going on right now. So we can direct you to the right official in the executive branch or in Congress to let them know that you care, you want us to continue to be a beacon of hope and freedom, and you want to allow these refugees in we expect that the presidential determination will be changed within the next month. And so now is the time to act. Well, Krish, thank you so much for being with us today on Just Solutions. Thank you for having me. And we encourage our, list, our viewers to tune in for the premiere of that documentary, A Home Called Nebraska, taking a look at refugee resettlement in Nebraska. It premieres on Free Speech TV on Thursday, May 6th at 7 Eastern. And next week on Just Solutions, we're going to continue our coverage of the aftermath of the guilty verdict in the Chauvin trial. What's next for policing in America? And indeed, what's next for racial justice? Same time, same place next week, right here. Free Speech TV, Just Solutions.